From the heart of our nation's capital, here's Family Research Council President Tony Perkins. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Washington Watch. We've got uh, quite the lineup for you today. First up, we'll be delving into Biden, the Biden administration's stance on Israel. Despite claims to the contrary, it's evident to many that there's been a shift in U.S. policy toward Israel. House Majority Leader Steve Scalise will join us in just a moment. We'll also discuss how Americans are reacting to the Biden peace deal that he is pushing on Israel when they find out who's empowered by it. Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, one and the same. Matthew Faraji, president of the Gideon 300, is here to talk about that. Then we'll turn our attention to Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene's ongoing drama. She's been making waves lately, particularly with her recent effort regarding House Speaker Mike Johnson. But this is basically a warning, and it's time for us to go through, through the process, take our time, and find a new Speaker of the House that will stand with Republicans and our Republican majority instead of standing with the Democrats. <laughs> How will Republicans navigate the historically narrow margins they will soon face when they return after the Easter break? Well, in other news, NBC executives made a controversial decision, more controversial, by pulling the plug on former RNC chair Ronna McDaniel's contract as a political contributor, capitulating to the likes of Rachel Maddow. It's not about hiring a Republican. It's not even about hiring somebody who has Trump ties. This was a really specific case because yeah. of Ms. McDaniel's and her involvement in the election interference stuff. And um, I'm, I'm grateful that our, our leadership was willing to do the, I think, the, the bold, strong, resilient thing. That was a giddy Maldow last night uh, after NBC announced they had totally surrendered to the cancel culture. We'll talk with the new RNC chairman, Michael Watley a little bit later here on Washington Watch. And don't forget, uh, Maddow and the others, their justification for hating on Ronna McDaniel was that she was an election denier. Now, if that's the case, why is there anyone at MSNBC? He's an illegitimate president in my mind. Would you be my vice presidential candidate? <laughs> but... Folks, look, I absolutely agree. Trump didn't actually win the election in 2016. He lost the election. And he was put in office because the Russians interfered. Trump knows he's an illegitimate president. The president-elect, although legally elected, is not legitimate. You said you believe that Russia's interference altered the outcome of the election. I do. We have a president who, if in fact it is proven, uh, has been assisted by the Russians and may in fact not be a legitimate president. I have an objection. I object to the 15 votes from the state of North Carolina. I object because people are horrified. That was just a few. Just a few from the left denying Trump's victory in 2016. So can you say hypocrisy? How about election integrity? Because that's what we're going to focus on later as Jody Heiss joins me to talk about his new book, Sacred Trust, Election Integrity and the Will of the People. So stay tuned for a packed show full of insightful discussions and analysis. But as we do, remember the bedrock principles that guide us here at Washington Watch. Faith, family, and freedom. And these are not just words. They are the very values that form the foundation of our nation. Washington Watch starts now. To the president worried about losing support from Gen no, this Z. Is, or, uh, let me be very clear. Let me be very clear. This is not about politics. It's not. The president does not lead his national security or things that are the right thing to do in this sense, right? Getting that hostage deal, making sure... Uh, Hostages come home, including, as I said, over and over again, American hostages getting that humanitarian aid into Gaza and making sure that it, it, we believe that would lead to a ceasefire. That is not about politics. That is about the right thing to do. That was White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre responding to a reporter asking about the politics of the U.S. abstaining from voting on a U.N. Security Council resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Israel's war against the Hamas terrorist organization. Now, as we talked about yesterday, only three times previously in the history of the Security Council has the United States abstained. In fact, 53 times they've used their veto power to stand with and aid Israel against the global goons. 
there's been a change in policy. Joining me now to discuss this and much more, House Majority Leader Steve Scalise. He represents the 1st Congressional District of Louisiana, and he's out campaigning, getting ready for the upcoming election as he's uh, helping out fellow Republicans. Leader Scalise, welcome back to Washington Watch. Hey, it's great to be back with you, Tony. Thanks for having me. So uh, when Congress returns, one of the first issues they will face is funding for our ally Israel, which currently is connected to funding of Ukraine, which does not have as much support in the House. What's going to happen? Well, you've seen us move strong Israel aid packages in the past. We're going to continue to make sure we're standing with Israel. And look at the threat you just uh, highlighted out of the White House. We're seeing open hostility towards uh, the Jewish state of Israel, towards uh, what uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and his united coalition government is trying to do to destroy and eviscerate from the White House. Um, they don't stand with this administration. I've never seen this before in the history of our relationship going back to the formation of Israel as a Jewish state. So we need to continue to stand with Israel. House Republicans surely do. And so we're going to make sure we get them the aid they need. Obviously, there's other issues where we're at odds. But on Israel, we are united in the House on the Republican side. What, what is happening to the Democrat Party is, is disgraceful to see them literally walking away uh, from Israel before our very eyes and, and having basically a warm embrace towards this, uh, uh, this, this movement you're seeing against Israel and towards uh, a lot of the uh, kind of the, the, the hostility against Israel. I, I don't know where it started coming from, but the, the, the far left uh, really started moving it. And I think people are fed up with that. So, so uh, Congressman Scalise, uh, you, you and I went to Israel a number of years ago, probably about, uh, about a dozen years ago, in a bipartisan uh, group from, from Congress, uh, Democrats and Republicans. And as you said, this historically, the issue of Israel standing with Israel, Israel has been a bipartisan issue until now. What's changed? I think you've seen the, the radical left take over the Democrat Party, and you've seen Joe Biden move with them. Joe Biden's always, again, if you look at his 50-year career in, in public office, he's been a weather vane for the Democrat Party. When they were the, you know, kind of the party that worked with Newt Gingrich to balance budgets, he was there with them when, when they were just kind of the traditional liberal union party. But then once they became a socialist movement with Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and AOC as the stalwarts, uh, Joe Biden started listening to them and taking his orders from them. Uh, and the problem is that they're hostile towards Israel. Uh, you saw Chuck Schumer making those comments the other day, calling for literally a change in administration. Uh, you even had some of Bibi's opponents in Israel standing behind Bibi because they're at war right now. This is not a right. time where you walk away from your allies. And yet some in the Democrat Party in Washington are doing just that. You saw you know, what the White House did, not vetoing that action by the the UN Security Council uh, to, to literally go after Israel, call for a ceasefire without even demanding that the hostages be released by Hamas. They're literally trying to equate Hamas and Israel on the same level, and they're not. Uh, Hamas ended the ceasefire on October 7th when they invaded and brutally murdered, barbarically murdered women, children, others, and took hostages that they still have to this day. So as you stated, Israel, the Republicans uh, unified funding for Israel. Will we see a separation? Right now, the supplemental includes both Israel, Ukraine, the bulk of the, the, the money going to Ukraine, and then some for Taiwan. Is the House going to separate that and deal with them one by one? Exactly how it happens is, is still open. A lot of discussions are going on. You know, there, there are a lot of there's a lot of interest as it relates to Ukraine, at least, number one, to see us stand up to Putin, but to make sure uh, that it's paid for. There's a bill called the Repo Act that would use Russian oligarch money to pay for uh, aid to Ukraine, for example, and only limit it to the lethal aid, not propping up their government. Um, and, and doing it as a loan, by the way, President Trump talked about that. There's a lot of interest in that as well. So, you know, no final decisions have been made, but some some good creative ideas are being put on the table uh, as it relates to Ukraine. But Israel, we've been right there with Israel and we will not waver. All right. Um, full disclosure, you and I are both good friends with uh, with Mike Johnson, all of us from Louisiana. 
Um, Mike inherited a pretty difficult job uh, after working the way through this last appropriations bill where the table was pretty much set for him. And there's a lot of bad stuff in those appropriations bills that, that conservatives, myself included, didn't like. W what options did he have? Uh, they were very limited, unfortunately, Tony. And, and part of it starts with with only a one seat majority in the House. There's some of our members that weren't going to support anything, no matter what you put. We wanted to put some border security measures uh, there. And there were some members that weren't even going to vote for that. And so, um, you know, the other side knows that and it weakens the negotiating position. But at the end of the day, you know, we made it clear we weren't going to go backward and fund any additional things. Joe Biden, by the way, wanted billions more to process more illegals. He didn't get that. In fact, he got a 20 percent cut. Uh, those NGOs, the groups that are moving illegals all around the country, they're going to take a 20 percent cut. Uh, I'd like to see even more cut. But at least that was something that was negotiated. The, the lion's share of that bill, by the way, over 70 percent of that bill was funding our Department of Defense, including the largest pay raise our troops have gotten in, day rate, in decades. And, and I think everybody would agree that our troops deserve that. We need to realign our Department of Defense to focus on the threat that China poses. That was also in the bill that doesn't get talked about because, you know, you and I can both agree on the things that we didn't like in that bill. 70 percent of the bill funds defense. If that goes away, we see a cut to defense at a time when the world is on fire. So, so some were saying, well, you should have just shut the government down over the issue and refuse to move forward with it. But at some point, you have to open government back up. And with that one seat margin, I mean, what would you have had to give up to open government back up? Couldn't the end result be worse than what we saw in this bill? Oh, it would have been much worse. And, and we had some of the members that were calling for a shutdown that were very clear that they wouldn't vote to come out of a shutdown. And, and look, let's be clear about a shutdown. Uh, a shutdown doesn't end Joe Bor Biden's border policy. Uh, the, the president during a shutdown gets to decide what gets funded and what doesn't. Uh, that's not a law I like. It's a law that goes back to the 1970s where Congress started giving away the power of the purse. I think a lot of people in America think that the federal government works like most states. You know, our home state of Louisiana is like most states that has what's called zero-based budgeting, meaning if there's a shutdown, everything goes to zero. Government doesn't get a dime until they get an agreement. That's not how Washington works. During a shutdown, everything gets funded at current levels except the things the president of the United States deems non-essential. Well, guess what? This president is going to deem essential and non-essential. It's not going to be the things you and I agree with. So, that's one of the challenges that you face is that if you get a shutdown, Joe Biden's making the decisions over what gets funded and what doesn't, you know, and he would cut defense right. uh, and other things that are important to us. He would not cut the processing of illegals. And we were just able to get a 20 percent cut there. We were able to give our Border Patrol agents more tools today to stop the flow of illegals, which is why the head of the Border Patrol supported that bill, by the way. So. You know, again, right. there were a lot of bad choices. The real answer, Tony, is in November. We've got to get Donald Trump elected president if we want to really stop this madness. I mean, and, this, and I think, by the way, I think that will happen. I mean, this is really kind of a choice between bad and ugly. Uh, and, and, yeah, you know, it, you're right. The ultimately, we've got to increase those margins and get uh, control of the Senate in order to get these measures through and the White House, I would add. Steve Scalise, great to see you. Thanks so much for taking time to join us today. Always great being back with you. Happy Easter, Tony. All right. Same to you, Steve. All right. Coming up, a new poll reveals what happens when the public actually sees what Biden is pushing in the Middle East. They don't like it. Stay tuned. Underscore scripture in the Bible is this scripture, John 15 and 5, Jesus speaking, 
for without me, you can do nothing. This is not about sucking it up. It's not about pulling up your bootstrap. It's about turning from this to something, someone, and his name is Jesus, who enables us and empowers us to be the men of God that he's called us to be. Brothers, listen to me. You have been endowed with authority from heaven to put your hand up against all of the forces of darkness that is coming against you and against your household. And if you will use that rightful authority, God himself will stand in back of it. God has given you, as the parent, as the father of your children, the responsibility and the authority to teach your children. You are not to outsource that to your wife or to your pastor. You are the spiritual leader of your home. You will never be faithful in serving your calling if you're not faithful in your family relationships. It just won't happen. I don't need entertainment. I don't need opinions. I don't need a soft message. I need the Bible. I came to hear the Word of God today. That's what we need today, the Word of God. I'm Tony Perkins, and I have a prediction. This year, there will be uncertainty and continued political and cultural division. Okay, so that's not that startling of a prediction, but try this. We can have peace and even joy amid the chaos. Jesus said in John 15, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Jesus told us there would be days like this so that our eyes would be upon him and his promises rather than our circumstances. Now, how can we keep our eyes on Jesus? Abide in him by being in his word. At Family Research Council, we wanna help you do that, which is the reason for the Stand on the Word Bible reading plan. With just 10 to 15 minutes each day, you will have read the entire Bible in just two years. But most importantly, you'll be abiding in him daily, living in his joy and peace in these trying times. Join me on this journey through the Bible. Go to frc.org slash Bible for more. Welcome back to Washington Watch. Good to have you with us on this uh, Wednesday afternoon. The website, TonyPerkins.com. And by the way, uh, lots of folks have uh, contacted us, say, yes, I want to pray for Israel. I want to, want to stand with Israel. And, and so let me encourage you, if you've not yet done that, uh, we've got something in the works, a uh, big day planned for uh, May on a Sunday. And I'll have more details about that as I've been talking with pastors across the country today. Uh, but if you'd like to know about that and be plugged in, text Israel to 67742. That's 67742, the word Israel. We've got to stand with Israel. In this election year, now the legacy media continues to play up headlines proclaiming that the public support for Israel has declined. Uh, we've, I saw a poll today. We've already seen the Biden administration abandon Israel just this week to appease their far left base. And, and as we were just talking about with Leader Scalise, this is historic because Israel and the support for Israel has been a bipartisan issue for a multitude of reasons. One, they're, they're our strongest ally in the Middle East. They're really a stabilizing force in the Middle East. And for most conservatives, Christians in particular, there's a spiritual component here. Now, they, uh, the media wants to say that hey, Americans are walking away. But a recent public survey conducted by Gideon 300 reveals that when voters become informed actually find out what the Biden administration is pushing and the fact that the Palestinian Authority is aligned with Hamas, the terrorist, yes, that's right, they dramatically shift their opinions, backing away from wanting to push Israel into a so-called peace deal. It's anything but peaceful. And uh, that shift is most dramatic among, guess who? Democrats. Joining me now to explain the numbers is Matthew Faraci. He is the president of Gideon 300. Matthew, welcome back to Washington Watch. Hey, and uh, don't I also get some honorific as uh, president of the Tony Perkins Jewish Fan Club or something like that? Uh, I think so. The T-shirt's the in the mail. <laughs> okay. Well, I, okay, I'm excited about your May event, Tony. So, Tony, one, one thing that exactly what you said, don't believe what you're seeing on Twitter. Hey, um, hey right, Matthew, or, let me stop you just a second. Move yeah. over move over to your right just a little bit. Okay. I want to see Alf. I want to see Alf oh, behind you. That's 
Sorry. This okay. is something that a passion that Tony and I share, which is a, a love for the show. Alf, this was back when television was wholesome and taught good values and you could have a good, clean laugh. That's right. right? Now, go Tony? ahead and finish your thought. <laughs> okay. So um, it, there's a Harris X. I'm not making this up. There's a Harris X Harvard TAPS poll that they do quite regularly. And one of the things that we've seen in this poll back from the beginning since October 7th is that support for Israel hovers around 79, 80% of America versus Hamas. This is voters versus Hamas. So I've seen this number over and over and over again. And in fact, one of the interesting trends is that young people have actually trended more more supportive, which again goes against everything you see from the propaganda official state media that we're fed every day. So we conducted a poll with Scott Rasmussen, RMG Research, which was fascinating. But Tony, can I back up and just tell your viewers for two seconds what's going on besides the whole Rafa yeah. uh, plan to stop the Rafa invasion? Okay. So the Biden State Department is, a lot of people have been wondering, why is there so much tension uh, between BB and the and Biden and the State Department and this whole thing. But what, what's the tension over? And part of the tension is clearly that the U.S., for various reasons which we could go into if we had more time, doesn't want Israel to finish the job and take out Hamas and invade Rafah. But the, the sleight of hand, the quiet other thing that they are pressuring Israel for is that they ultimately want Israel to settle for a two-state solution, which which means the end of Israel. And uh, the State Department, from public reports that are out there that I've read and other people, a lot of other people have read, is trying to polish up the Palestinian Authority and make them look more palatable so that, because the question is, Tony, who, if there's a two-state solution, who would such a solution be with? Who's the, who's the person making the deal on the other end? And what the Biden administration is doing is saying, well, that, that's going to be the Palestinian Authority, the more moderate, peaceful uh, wing, of, you know, wing of, the, of the governance over there. So we asked voters this sort of simple question, hey, would you be open to a peace deal with the Palestinian Authority, and, roughly? And about 55% slim majority said, sure, that doesn't sound like a bad idea. And then in the survey, and this was, I give Scott all the credit for this, not my idea at all. Scott's idea was, well, why don't we ask them, we'll put other information in front of them and see if people change their view. So we said, essentially, given the Palestinian Authority's alignment with Hamas, for example, Tony, you know they called for a unity government with Hamas before they moderated their stance and said, oh, wait a minute, we might have to wait because of public opinion. Um, but it, given that a lot of the people, um, uh, a lot of the, for instance, people in Palestinian Authority controlled areas have voiced support for Hamas in some polls as high as 80 percent. Given that there have been over 4,000 attempted terrorist attacks from um, just the West Bank since October 7th, once people started to learn the details of that, they swung in their opinion. And Tony, I've never seen a swing this big. In any poll I've so, ever done, and I've done hundreds of them. So, Matthew, you're saying facts matter? Yeah, shocking. Shocking. Facts matter. And, and Tony, the biggest swing was Democrats. 30 points. They went from majority in support of this deal to uh, against the deal. So let me ask so, you this. I, I know you haven't, you haven't asked this question, but let me put one out there that you ought to ask. When we look at the money that's actually flowing from the United States to Iran, remember all the money we unfroze that we we I, I was over in Israel just a week and a half ago and was briefed showing me the money trail of that money from Iran going to Hamas, Hezbollah. We also have the U.N. giving we've given a billion dollars in the last three years. That money has gone to Hamas as well. Um, Matthew, I'm hearing music. That means we're out of time. But those are some questions you should dig into because you've got some good information here. And I think the public needs to know the facts. It makes a well, difference. Let me, just leave you, let me just leave you with this, Tony. When I first came to D.C. a million years ago, I worked for the great legendary TV host, John McLaughlin, who you knew. 
And John told me to remember one rule, which I thought was so cynical at the time, and now I realize it's true. He yep. said, just remember that politics always drives policy. That's every right. Time. That's right. Thanks, Matthew. Stick with us, folks. We're coming Thanks, back Tony. after this. Welcome back to Washington Watch, the website, TonyPerkins.com. And to join us in praying for Israel, text the word Israel to 67742. I'm going to actually have a little bit more for you. I want to, sh I want to show you a map that uh, um, Matthew kind of made reference to the area. I want, I want to show that to you a little bit later. But first, the cancel culture. Yes, it came for yet another conservative voice. Following on-air meltdowns from the likes of Chuck Todd and Rachel Maddow, NBC News has canceled former in, uh, uh, RNC chairwoman Ronna McDaniel as an on-air contributor. Now, thanks to those brave journalists over at MSNBC, viewers will not have to worry about getting triggered when they hear a conservative voice. But why was Ronna such a sore spot for NBC News? And what is the deeper motivation in their trying to smear certain conservatives by calling them election deniers when they themselves denied the outcome of the 2016 election. Joining me now to discuss this, Michael Watley, the new chair of the Republican National Committee. Michael, welcome to Washington Watch. It is great to be on with you, Tony. I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to talk with you and uh, all the work that you do. Well, and I let me first of all congratulate you and your new uh, position as a RNC chair. I, I know you're going to do a great job, um, but, you know, you're going to take a lot of arrows. Uh, the target is on you now, uh, just as it was on on Rana. Um, this program actually started because of the cancel culture. We've we've been doing this now. We were kind of at the tip of the spear when the cancel culture came. But what does this tell us about legacy media? when someone like Rana, who is leading a national party, cannot even find a space when there's all kinds of Democrats over there. Yeah, it really is. It just speaks to the double standard that we're seeing out of the media these days. You know, you think about Jen Psaki, who went straight from uh, the, White, uh, the Biden White House to MSNBC. Uh, not a single complaint from any of their journalists uh, over there. You know, the fact that cycle after cycle, we see guys like Chuck Todd, and George Stephanopoulos get hired, and there's absolutely not a peep. But when Rana gets uh, brought on board, uh, you'd act like it was the end of the world. I think that uh, this just really shows you uh, 
uh, the bias that we see from the liberal elite media. You know, they repeatedly said this was because she denied the election outcome of of 2020. Is this to try to scare people like yourself, people of influencers, people in significant positions from questioning the outcome of future elections when this is something that they've done for years, multiple times? Yeah, I think there's really two things to it. The first is exactly what you just said. They really do want to try and silence all dissent. You know, you think about President Trump and, and his amazing presence on social media uh, from 2016 through 2020, and they shut him down. You think about all of these efforts to keep Republicans, to keep conservatives off of the airways, no matter how they, no matter what type of airway it is. Uh, that's very, very, very real. And I, and I think the other thing is that they really, truly want to make sure that their viewers are only getting one side of any given debate, which is really unfortunate. You know, when the American voters are informed voters, they make better decisions. And it really is hard uh, for Republicans uh, to, to constantly see the bias in the media and, and be able to say, OK, well, how are we going to react to it? Um, we know that the, the mainstream media is going to be biased. The key is, how are we going to react to it? And we just have to be able to go out and find venues just like this, find opportunities to talk directly to voters, uh, to, to go compete in that social media space, to create uh, opportunities like President Trump did with Truth, uh, and to go out there and, and find other opportunities through alternative media platforms to get our message out to the voters. You know, it, it's unfortunate because I, I actually think uh, it, it's healthy to have conversations even when you disagree with one another. I think there's actually something unifying about that. W when I came to Family Research Council 20 plus years ago, believe it or not, I was on MSNBC every week with Chris Matthews and we were having debates, uh, but we could do that. The left, he was a liberal, the left is different. They don't want to have a conversation. They want to shut down any dissenting views I, what that's doing, in my opinion, is dividing America. I, I could not agree more. And the fact is, is they want that polarization. They want that division. You know, when you think about where the left is coming from, and I, and I don't even say Democrats, I say the left, you know, where they're coming at is they want to dismantle the family. They want to dismantle America. What they want to do is make everybody dependent on the government for everything. Uh, they want to really kind of take this country down a road where the American people do not want to go. And a key component for them is to be able to stifle that debate and put their message out. I mean, George Orwell really, truly was onto something uh, when he when he was writing about what America has is, is these folks want to try and create. Right. Uh, about 20 seconds left. You've committed you're going to give voters a clear contrast, pushing forward policies through the Republican Party platform that give voters in America a clear choice. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you think about it. Every American family is concerned about the same thing. They're concerned about jobs in the economy. They're concerned about education. They're concerned about safety and national security. Those are the issues that the American voters care about. Doesn't matter whether they're rural or urban or suburban. Doesn't matter whether they're in the North or they're in the South or they're in the West. It is all down to those family-based issues. And the Republicans listen to those voters. They understand the issues and they're putting solutions on the table, which is why we feel we're in a great position to draw a contrast with Joe Biden and the Democrats and win big in November. Well, we look forward to talking with you more about that, Chairman Watley, in the days and weeks ahead. Thanks so much for joining us today. Yes, sir. Take care. All right, folks, stick with us. We're coming back with more Washington Watch when Jody Heiss joins me after the break. The Lord reigns. Let America rejoice. From coast to coast, let justice reign, peace reign, righteousness reign. Lord, let it rain. May the clouds of blessings gush and rain down upon us. Yet even in the clouds, we see the light of your face. Make your face shine on these states, we pray. We pray and then we work. We work in the strength you provide. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Strengthen our hands to do 
all to God's glory. Whether we eat or drink or vote, everything is holy. So we vote to God's glory. We vote because we can. We vote because we love our nation. We vote because we love our people. The people rejoice when the righteous rule, but when the wicked rule, the people mourn. Adorn our land with oaks of righteousness. Place men, place women, place those in authority who know their place, who know that they are under authority. Men and women who will stand for the true, for the good, for a more beautiful America. But how can they stand if we don't stand? We must stand. Lift us up. Help us stand. Raise us to that summit, which is yourself. For those you raise to that summit, do not fall. You are able to keep us from falling. Until that day when we do fall, fall before your throne, where our king reigns now. Now, let us rejoice and pray, vote, stand. Amen. Research has found that there are 59 million American adults who are a lot like you. There are millions of people around the country who are born again, deeply committed to practicing their faith, and believe the Bible is the reliable Word of God. But that's not all. They're also engaged in our government. They're voters. They're more likely to be involved in their community, and they're making a difference in elections. The problem is that a lot of them feel alone too. We want to change that. FRC wants to connect these 59 million Americans to speak the truth together, no matter the cost. If you want to learn more about this group and what it means to be a spiritually active, governance-engaged conservative, or if you want to find out if you are one of these sage cons yourself, join us. Go to frc.org slash s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sage con, to learn more. That's s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sage con, to learn more. This is Washington Watch, and I'm Tony Perkins, your host, and we are so happy you've chosen to join us today. The website, TonyPerkins.com. Earlier in my conversation with Matthew, he was talking about uh, Israel, talking about the this uh, peace agreement, the two-state solution that's being pushed by the Biden administration on Israel. Now, if you're driving in a car, listening on the radio, you obviously will not be able to see what I'm about to put up on the screen. If you're watching on TV, let me explain this to you. Uh, let's put up the map. This is a map of Israel. And it, again, facts make so much difference. If you look at what's called the West Bank, that's the heart of Israel, right? That's where 70 percent of the activities that we read about in the Bible took place. Uh, that is Jericho, Bethlehem, he uh, Bethlehem um, Hebron. It it's where the Mount of Blessing and Cursing uh, is at. It even includes part of Jerusalem. And if you, you see it there, if you're looking at the screen, that's the green striped area. How could you defend the rest of Israel if you take the heart of it out? That's exactly what they're proposing. And if you look down at the bottom left, the little green stri uh, strip there, that's Gaza. All this trouble coming out of that little strip and look at compare by comparison, the West Bank, what all they want to give to the Palestinian Authority that sympathizes with Hamas. Unworkable. Gaza was a two-state solution. It didn't work. Since 2007, Hamas was voted in as the governing authority there, and look what they've done. We need to pray for Israel, need to stand with Israel. Join us in doing so. Text the word Israel to 67742. That's Israel to 67742. Our word for today comes from Numbers chapter 31. Then Moses sent them to the war, 1,000 from each tribe. He sent them to the war with Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, with the holy articles and the signal trumpets in his hand. And they warred against the Midianites, just as the Lord commanded Moses, and they killed all the males. All right, so 12,000 warriors. And who was going before them? Who was leading them? Phinehas, the priest. Phinehas was to go with the warriors, carrying the trumpets, communicating the commands. Now, don't miss this. The spiritual leader was right there in the mix with Joshua, the leader of the army. 
Now, Phineas apparently wasn't concerned about his 501c3 nonprofit status. Pastors and churches today have been pushed from the public square as some political leaders have declared spiritual and moral issues like the sanctity of life and human sexuality as political issues and therefore off limits to the church. It's time for pastors to rise up and take their leadership role. To join us in our journey through the Bible, text BIBLE to 67742. That's the word BIBLE to 67742. That's a text that will transform your life. Well, in our last segment, I discussed how NBC News canceled former RNC chairwoman Ronna McDaniel after their staff threw a temper tantrum on the air. I, I, I hope it's obvious that this is about more than Ronna McDaniel or conservative voices. If the left calls every election they lose rigged, while conservatives will lose their job simply for raising questions, that's a road to compromising our election system. They want to silence and discourage conservatives from getting involved at a time when we need people willing to step forward, serve in election systems, and be whistleblowers if necessary. Joining me now to discuss this and more, FRC Action President Jody Heiss. He served for uh, eight years in Congress and has uh, a book coming out next week on this very topic, Sacred Trust, Election Integrity, and the Will of the People. Jody, welcome back to Washington Watch. Tony, always great to be with you. Thanks for the incredible job you do. Well, thank you, and thank you for being our Friday host here and, and often filling in for me when I'm out on the road. So the timing of your book couldn't be more perfect, particularly given your passion for this issue. In fact, before joining FRC, you ran for secretary of state in your home state of Georgia, which oversaw elections. Georgia's loss was FRC's gain. Uh, you know something about this issue. This is a bigger issue than Ronna McDaniel or conservatives appearing on legacy media, right? Yeah, it really is, Tony. You know, when there are so many issues we're dealing with in our country, and you kind of like throw a dart at, to, to land on a major issue, be it the border or our military, the economy, attacks on religious liberty, so many major issues. But one of those major issues, uh, when you're dealing with a constitutional republic like we have, is free and fair elections. Uh, there is no question that if we ever lose election integrity in this country, then we lose everything. And once that is lost, you can't regain it. I mean, if, if election integrity does not exist, then how do you ever get back the will of the people in this country? And, you know, at the end of the day, elections are not necessarily about who wins. What it is about is whether or not it was an accurate portrayal of the will of the people. Did the people's will prevail in, a, you know, if, if that is the case and my candidate loses, I may be disappointed, but I can come back next time and try to rally the right. voters, rally the board and try to regain it. But if the election integrity issue is removed, then our entire republic and the will of the people is removed. So so give our, our viewers and listeners an overview of sacred trust. What, what, what are they going to find when they open the pages of sacred trust? Well, it's kind of three parts. Underlying all of it is the issue of election integrity. But a lot of people want to know, how did I, uh, a former pastor, ever end up in Congress? So I share a little bit as to that story is kind of a, a really quite an interesting story and the footsteps of, of footprints of God leading me to Congress in an area I never dreamed. It was never on my radar. But then in addition, second part deals with some of the experiences in Congress, particularly as it raced, uh, relates to the battle of election integrity, which I was a major voice and a major uh, person on the end of the spear on that issue, being a part of the oversight committee. And then the overlying arch uh, topic is election integrity. And that runs all throughout the book, but the major portion of it deals with that issue, both where we have been in the past, where we are right now on this issue, and some steps that must be taken in order for us to secure election integrity for future generations. All right. Before I ask you this next question, I, um, I assure you that I am not going to cancel your contract if you answer in a way that uh, I, I disagree with. Um, are, you, are you concerned about what happened in the 2020 election? Do you think that there were irregularities that led to that outcome? 
Yeah, I am concerned. That's why I, from Georgia, uh, challenged the election results from Georgia. Uh, and listen, I, I'm not alone in that. Democrats have been challenging elections for decades, and yet they somehow get a pass. But allow uh, a conservative to say, look, there's there's something that doesn't register well with this last election. Let's back up. Let's make sure that it's an accurate portrayal of the will of the people. And all of a sudden we get in trouble. But yeah, I, I have serious concerns. Everything, look, and all of it came out of covid it was because of COVID that we saw Democrats, and this was uh, under our jurisdiction in the Oversight Committee, we saw Democrats start pushing for e election changes, for a federal takeover of election, right, right. pushing certain pieces of legislation. And those, uh, those pushes made significant changes in elections all throughout our country. And yes, there were serious concerns that need to be addressed. Let, let me, just so people... I played this at the beginning of the show, but I want to play this clip again so that people don't say you're just saying that Democrats challenge the election results. I, I want to pr play this kind of it's a montage of Democratic politicians and others questioning the 2016 election when Donald Trump won play clip seven. He's an illegitimate president in my mind. Would you be my vice presidential candidate? For <laughs> Folks, look, I absolutely agree. Trump didn't actually win the election in 2016. He lost the election, and he was put into office because the Russians interfered. Trump knows he's an illegitimate president. The president-elect, although legally elected, is not legitimate. You said you believe that Russia's interference altered the outcome of the election. I do. We have a president who, if in fact it is proven, uh, has been assisted by the Russians and may in fact not be a legitimate president. I have an objection. I object to the 15 votes from the state of North Carolina. I object because people are horrified. So did, did, did all of that go down the memory hole? Uh, everybody just forgot it all about have. it? Yeah, it must have, Tony. I, listen, that is a powerful, powerful montage. And, and it, it displays the, the reality. I let uh, the, the all the appearance is if you're a left left wing individual, you can protest, you can do anything you want to, you can challenge elections. Uh, uh, look, uh, Stacey Abrams right here in, in, in our own state of Georgia. She she didn't concede her loss of governorship for forever. I mean, it goes on and on and on. The d different examples, what you just played there, is just a tip of the iceberg. In fact, I saw that uh, a recent Rasmussen poll, Tony, fifty seven percent are already now saying, of Democrats, are saying they would challenge uh, and not certify President Trump's uh, uh, election if he wins uh, th later this year in November. Well, because uh, they're sore okay. because they because they're cheating didn't win? I mean, is yeah, that... I mean, look, we haven't even had an election, and they're talking about don't certify it. So... Uh, so I, I don't want to run out of... I don't want to run, run out of time here, because uh, in the book, Laying Out the Sacred Trust... It is a sacred trust. I mean, it is it is what keeps America going. And it's what you said. It's not so much. I mean, I've, I've only want, lost one election in, in all the years that I've ran for office. Um, but I knew I could come back and, and run again and, and work a little harder. You, you improve what you, you do if I wanted to run again. But if you feel like the system's rigged against you, uh, then that's a whole different thing. That, that's that's uh, deflating. That's discouraging. And that causes people to re react either to shrink back and not be involved or to get angry and, and take inappropriate actions. Since 2020, there has been uh, there have been a number of reform efforts in states across the nation, mostly red states. But elected leaders did respond to the problems in 2020 and our votes, while there's always going to be the chance that something happens and there's manipulation, we're better off today than we were in 2020. Would you agree? Yeah, I would agree. And, I, and I'm very grateful for that. And it's because there were problems. If there was no problems, then there was nothing to fix. Good point. But the fact that you have seen one state after another after another across the board pass stronger election laws, that indicates that they have seen consistently that there are issues that need to be corrected. So, yeah, overall, I do feel much better going into this election. And for that and with that, uh, Tony, it is critical that no one misses out on an election. Well, I don't vote. Your vote is going to count, uh, and we've got to keep pushing this. And at the same time, well, we do need boots on the ground, people working in their precincts, people being involved 
eyes and boots on the ground make a huge difference to maintain accountability and transparency. Right, so volunteer with your local Republican county parish party where you can do poll watching, be certified as a poll watcher, make sure there's no cheating, uh, just be present. But I want to go back to what you just said. Make sure you vote. And now, as conservatives, we would prefer that we have one-day elections and everybody votes on that day. But that's not the way it is. Uh, the left has changed the laws. We need to use the laws uh, to our advantage as they have. If you can vote early, vote early. If you can vote by mail, I, I would encourage you to drop your uh, uh, ballot off in person. I, I wouldn't necessarily trust the mail. But we need to be encouraging people to turn out and use the laws to our advantage. Uh, that's right. The laws are the laws. And when it's a law, it applies on both sides. So use the laws, whatever they are in your state, use them, cooperate with them, uh, vote early if that's uh, 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 legal in your state. What, whatever the case may be, uh, we need to exercise, you're exactly right, exercise the laws uh, to the best of our ability, but don't sit home and do nothing. Our uh, our, ours is a system that does not work without involvement of the people. And the, the epicenter of that involvement is for the people to get out and vote. And for us not to exercise that most basic right has drastic consequences. We hear every election that this is the most important election ever. Well, really, when we come to this one, this is probably the most, election, most important election ever. This will transform the direction and the trajectory of our entire nation. I mean, I, I think that statement is correct because every election we face as the nation becomes more divided is the most important election because we've seen such a shift. Uh, it, it's no longer, it used to be you kind of just changed jerseys, but the plays were the same. That's not the case anymore between the two political parties. It is a stark contrast between the two parties, as we're seeing in the Biden administration, the pushing of the whole LGBTQ agenda, abortion funding, uh, the international policy that runs counter to uh, the values that made America strong and build family and community. All of that is under assault, and it's the result of an election. Absolutely. And I've heard you say it probably a hundred times. I've said it over and over as well, that uh, elections have consequences. They always do. And the uh, greater the consequence, uh, it, the, the greater the importance to get out and vote. And so this is the time to make sure that you do that. And uh, fortunately, we've had so many states that have put forth legislation to make sure that every vote is going to count. And so we, we've got to go yep. uh, work all that we can to make sure. We, we need to go vote and also get a copy of Sacred Trust. How can folks get a copy of that? It's coming out next week, but you can pre-order by going to Amazon. And uh, we're, we're excited about this, Tony. Like you said, the timing uh, as we uh, enter into this election cycle is extremely important. And so you can go to Amazon. You can order your book right now today. All right, pick up a copy of Sacred Trust. All right, Jody Heiss, great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, sir. All right, folks, I want to thank you for joining us as well. I want to encourage you to join us in praying for and standing with Israel. Text Israel, the word Israel, to 67742. Be praying. And then, of course, be voting. And be standing for truth. As the Apostle Paul says, when you've done everything you can do, when you've prayed, when you've prepared, and when you've taken your stand, by all means, keep standing. Washington Watch with Tony Perkins is brought to you by Family Research Council and is entirely listener supported. Portions of the show discussing candidates are brought to you by Family Research Council Action. For more information on anything you've heard today or to find out how you can partner with us in our ongoing efforts to promote faith, family and freedom, visit TonyPerkins.com. Also, to leave a comment about Washington Watch, call our watch line at 1-866-372-7234. That's 1-866-372-7234.